I don't know if I have that. I don't know. You did? Okay. There we are. Hello. Hello and welcome. Welcome. My name's Janice Weller and I'm a musician and I'm also a board member of sort of Music Coalition and I'm honored to be part of this panel today and your moderator um, and excited to welcome this terrific panel um, to talk about such an important topic. So this is accessibility for musicians and music industry professionals with disabilities. Um, and uh, we do have a group agreement that we've been using. Um, and if it's okay with you, I will just walk us through that. Um, and that is together we will hold each other accountable. We'll listen for understanding. We'll acknowledge our own privileges and the space we take up and or hold because of this privilege. Center the voices of black people, indigenous people, and people of color that choose to share in this space. Own our mistakes, our intentions, and our impacts. Respect each other's experiences. Speak honestly and from our own experience. Appreciate silence and processing time. And exercise self-care. And if there are any other agreements you'd like to add, this would be the time to do that. Anyone have anything they'd like to add? Okay. No, so. Nope. All right. Let's get underway then. Um, I thought I would just give a very quick introduction to each of you, and then you'll have time um, once I've done that to really um, flesh out your own experiences uh, as well, too. So, uh, Gabriel Roderick is a multidisciplinary artist known by his project name Freak. Following his spinal cord injury, Freak has unshakably continued to make evocative and transformative music, visual art, and dance works that focus on ways to rise above a society that constantly tells members they are not enough. Jamie Schumacher came from California to Minnesota in 2003. And uh, while director of the West Bank Business Association, Jamie helped secure Cedar Riverside among Minneapolis's city designated cultural dis districts. She also helped prioritize accessibility in Cedar Riverside from the sidewalks to the stages. She now works with LISC, Local Initiative Support Cor uh, Corporation in the Twin Cities, working with cultural and creative districts of Minneapolis and St. Paul. Stephen Letness is the founder and executive director of Able Artist Foundation, a 501c3 that supports and empowers artists with disabilities by building relationships with companies to make products more affordable to those on fixed incomes and dispersing grants to career-minded musicians looking to take their careers to the next level. Being visually impaired, Letness understands the challenges those with disabilities face. <coughs> and finally, we have Donald Jaeger, Jaeger, is that right? Jaeger, okay. Um, a pioneer in the music industry and founder of the Coalition for Disabled Musicians, CDM, born out of his passion to continue playing the drums after a spinal cord injury. CDM creates a path in which musicians with disabilities can develop and perform their gifts and show the world that music has no boundaries. Donald has invented stands and contraptions to help disabled musicians play and perform. He currently lives in Virginia, where he still advocates and powers and, of course, continues his passion of playing drums and performing. Uh, what a great group. I'm really looking forward to this conversation today. Nice to meet you, Yeah, it'll be great. So I have some questions for you. We will also be collecting questions from those who are out in Internet land that are, are watching this. Um, and we'll do have time for a question and answer towards the end, too. So I'd like to ask each of you to share what brings you to the conversation today and why the conversation about accessibility for musicians with disabilities is so important. Um, and you can take some time with this. Um, you allocated about 10 minutes, so you can really tell your story if you'd like to. Anyone like to start that process? Or shall I call on you? <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> You want to start? Who me? I guess I can do that. Oh yeah. Um, uh, who was who said that? Oh, Stephen, go ahead. You can do it. Okay, sure. All right. I go, go for it. Give me a chance to have my brain a little. 
<laughs> sure. Yeah. It's uh, uh, what I'm really thrilled about. Actually, even just within this panel, I think there. Uh, I would like to reach out to each of you, <laughs> uh, and and get to know each of you better. Um, but yeah, I'm I'm Stephen Lennis. My day job is I'm a film composer, and I write music for movies. Um, I've and uh, I'm visually impaired, so I uh, getting into an industry uh, with a disability. There's nobody out there. Uh, as a film composer, who I could look up to, uh, somebody with a disability, like, oh wow, they are at the height of their game, uh, and they have a disability. They they don't exist. Uh, and so for years, I, as I was building up in the film industry, I realized, wow, there there's some needs that need to be met, and why can't I find composers uh, with disabilities in the industry? Uh, and as and as I've, I've grown and made new relationships, well, I found out why. It's because they were told not to bring it up. And uh, I've spoken to some people who have partnered with some uh, people way up on the list uh, and who have worked with A-list composers, and they've been told, don't bring it up. You won't get hired. And so the stigma exists in the film industry. Now, so for those of you... Uh, watching and listening at home, I'm, I'm speaking from a perspective of uh, the, the film industry itself. Uh, I am a piano player, um, uh, but I haven't performed uh, for a few years. And so most of my time is as a film composer. Um, and I just, quick little pitch. Uh, we just, we did a documentary uh, about uh, George Floyd called Say His Name, and it's going to be premiering on uh, TPT here in uh, on May 25th. Uh, but as I, you know, got through the industry and realized, wow, where, where are my people? Where's my community of people that I can commune with and discuss the challenges? They are not there. So I said, well, maybe, well, I see a need. So I started the foundation. I started Able Artists Foundation as a way to lower the cost of products for people who not only aren't getting jobs uh, because of a disability or uh, primarily because of a disability, and thus they don't have the money to, to purchase these very expensive products. Or uh, as some of us may know, uh, a number of people with disabilities, approximately 17 million Americans are on SSI and SSDI. How somebody uh, with a spinal injury who's receiving $750 a month gonna pay for the 30, 40, 50, 60,000 dollars of products so that they can practice and compete with people even even uh, middle and career. So that's why I started the nonprofit. And that's going into grant programs, contests, job opportunities. We partner with music licensors uh, to get composers and musicians with disabilities, get their original music into film and television so they can make some money, so we can lift up their standard of living. Uh, and most recently, I'll, I'll button it up with this. Uh, most recently, recently, I've been involved with uh, people out in LA. Uh, we've started a another nonprofit uh, called One in Four, and we are writers, producers, showrunners, actors, directors, uh, uh, comedians. Every one of us has a disability. It is an intersectional group. People from all over the place, all underrepresented groups, and our goal is to encourage. Uh, I, I won't use any other words, to encourage the film industry to hire people with disabilities because people with disabilities are, we're a fourth of the population, we're 1% of the people on your screen, and of that 1% of disabled people on screen, 95% of those people are non-disabled people playing disabled roles. What's that about? Uh, so we're gonna change that. Uh, and uh, a final example is the Oscars this year for the first time in their 93 year history, they added a ramp uh, to the stage. Because as we might remember from a few years ago, Ali Stroker, who won the Tony uh, for Oklahoma, there was no ramp for her to go receive her award. And with the Oscars, my buddy Jim is the director of Crip Camp. He was up uh, for best director uh, for, for best documentary. Uh, they finally had a ramp after 93 years. And uh, so that's the kind of work uh, that we are doing out in LA uh, for people in front of and in our position and especially uh, behind the camera, people you don't see to hire people with disabilities. Uh, and so I, I think I've taken up enough time with that intro 
Uh, but but thank you everybody for for viewing this and for listening to this. And and you know what? Uh, one thing I forgot to do. I am visually impaired, and so this is important. I wonder if there are any visually impaired musicians who are watching and listening to this now. I am a white male. I have short light brown hair. I am wearing a button down black shirt. And I'm sitting in a room with taupe walls, which is kind of like khaki. It's very gross. And I'm gonna have it painted soon. So, and thank you for, for being here. And I'm, I'm pleased to be here. Thanks so much, Stephen. Uh, Donald, would you like to, to go next? Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Donald Jager. Um, I am founder of the Coalition for Disabled Musicians. Um, I did not play music when I was younger. I always wanted to since I was a kid and I saw the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show. I was 10, but there was a house full of kids, eight kids in my house, uh, no room for drums or anything like that. And I just had this feeling in me that I always wanted to play. But I was an athlete in my younger years and I started working young because uh, my dad needed help and uh, finished high school and started college and continued with um, working, uh, being a, an athlete, and then uh, got married. I got my drums when I was 21, but my I met my wife, who is my wife now, and uh, there was no time. I still had to work, and then we got married, and then I got hurt when I was 26. I worked on a tugboat because I worked on boats all of my younger life. I dug clams, fishing boats, party boats, and then ultimately on tugboats and then in New York. And then I fell and got really badly hurt. So everything stopped for years, five years. My whole life was just drastically came to a screeching halt. When I turned 30, I was uh, just always thought that I wanted to play and was a unable to because of endurance and play like in an able body situation. And I wasn't learning anything uh, and it was very depressed. And I was also in the middle of a, a, a very big case with work that I got hurt on the job. But I talked to my lawyer, I talked to my doctors and everybody agreed that uh, if I started an organization for musicians with disabilities, uh, and my my point was to be able to learn to play at my own pace with others that have a similar situation. So uh, they said, OK, good. Go ahead. Go for it. And I did. And I met a couple of other people that um, had muscular dystrophy. I knew two people that had muscular dystrophy at the time. Uh, and we formed the Coalition for Disabled Musicians on February 22 of uh, 1986. Um, the first thing was uh, to just start playing music. And it was for musicians, not for so much the disability community. And uh, it turned out to be an incredible therapy program, which I didn't realize was going to be at the time, because music is the ultimate therapy for all sorts of things. For me, it was very physical. For some of the, the girls with uh, muscular dystrophy, singers, their lungs, their doctors, they said that uh, singing just helped that they actually were getting better where it, it was such a progressive disease uh, that they were never getting better, but singing really helped them. Uh, this is pre-ADA because the Americans with Disabilities Act didn't uh, officially come into law until uh, July 26th of 1990. And, uh, but they actually started talking about it the same year that I started CDM. So it was pretty amazing that all this was taking place at the same exact time. Uh, and I had no idea about that and they had no idea about me. But uh, one of the biggest things that, um, and problems that we had to overcome was accessibility. Uh, Stephen was saying about the stage at the, at the awards, when we started doing gigs at these little town uh, festivals and stuff, and they had uh, these mobile stages pull in, there was no ramps. There was nothing. We had to bring little portable ramps, and they were steep, and power chairs are super heavy. And then they would bring forklifts, and they'd sit on top of pallets, and they'd lift them on pallets. And it was terrifying for these people in wheelchairs to get up onto a stage. And then, of course, the next year and the year after that, then they started building ramps for them. 
And then, of course, as time went by, then it became a mandatory thing that they had to have. And everything that was built new, especially after the ADA started, that ramps had to be incorporated in any new structures um, uh, and all portable uh, showmobiles like that. Um, also, was all these curb cuts. There was no curb cuts. There was no accessibility at all. Um, uh, there, uh, something else that I'm thinking about here uh, that I can't think about. Sorry, I'm getting old. You see, when she said I was a pioneer, I mean, I was a pioneer back in the horse and buggy days. No, not really. But um, So, yeah, so a lot of things have happened. Uh, stigma. Uh, did we talk about all this stuff all at one time here? Were you going to have questions later on and talk about well, these things? I have a lot of examples. Yeah, I've got lots of questions for you. Okay. <laughs> But what yes, we, we had a lot of battles with all of that stuff, but we'll leave that for questions later and I'll let somebody else introduce themselves. Okay, that sounds great, Donald. Thank you. Yeah. And nice to meet all of you. I'm, I'm really happy and proud of all of you for stepping up and doing something. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, Gabriel, you're next on my screen. Yeah, uh, so my name is Gabriel. I, I'm a musician here in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Um, I am also, uh, I also have a spinal cord injury similar to Dolanum's. Um, I was injured when I was 15 years old. Um, and before my injury, I played piano for about 11 years. And I have a C5 spinal cord injury, which means I've, um, I have impairment in all four limbs. So I've lost hand function and some of my arms and shoulders. Um, so I lost the ability to play piano after my injury. Um, and it took me about three or four years to like start to realize that I could still make music. Um, I started using Logic Pro, I started singing, um, and I it was at the time I was going to school at MCTC. Uh, the local community college and didn't know what I was doing there. So I dropped out and started a band. Um, that band was called Treading North and we played around the cities and around the Midwest for about five years. Um, and then we disbanded and I started my project called Freak. Um, it's my solo music music project. Um, I sing, write all the music, um, and I actually play a little piano as well. I strap a pencil to my wrist and I pluck one note at a time and sing over that. Um, and so I've been doing Freak for the past few years. And then um, that also led me to create uh a live music live dance production i have called a cripples dance um it's uh live music live dance production performed and created by people with spinal cord injuries and people with able bodies um and we've done about three three productions of that um and before covid came we were getting ready to um start touring the show um but uh now we can't so we're <laughs> we're kind of on hold with the cripples dance um i've been pretty busy with freak doing a lot of recording um and yeah so that's that's kind of what i do where i'm at um a as a performer i've you know i've <laughs> and a at a wheelchair user i've been lifted up onto many a stage. I've been carried down into basements for house shows. Um, I've I've kind of done it all uh, without the accessibility. Um, but it's gotten to a point where I'm I'm kind of tired of doing all that, and I'm I would love to see um, more accessibility throughout the throughout the music scene, throughout the theater scene. You know, uh, all all performance spaces. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much. It seems 1990 is the ADA. That's 30, 
one years ago, and we still have such a long ways to go. Long way to go, but a lot happened since then. But yes, a long way to go. Yes, yes definitely a lot has happened, but there's a lot to do, to do too. And Jamie, mm -hmm. you've been a, a champion for um, for accessibility. And um, would you share kind of your background and, and how you got into this and what you're doing? Um, sure. Um, so my name is Jamie Schumacher, she, hers. Um, I'm a multiracial person um, with brown hair, green eyes, a prominent nose, and I'm sitting in front of a pumpkin orange wall with art on it. Um, I am um, I'm an artist, I'm an author, um, and I also work a lot with nonprofit communities. So um, uh, prior to my current role, I currently work with LISC, um, as Janice mentioned, but before that I worked with the West Bank in the West Bank District. Um, and I worked with a uh, lot of venues and small businesses, a lot of nonprofits, and a lot of you know really really old buildings. And um, I used to also run an art gallery in Northeast um, in a building that was like 150 years old. So um, a lot of the work we did um, was around you know general. We did some work around general neighborhood accessibility. You know on Cedar Avenue, um, one example, we had half of our sidewalk, the Palmer side. Um, it was like the slope was not up to code. It was like a really steep slope and they had planted the trees like down the middle for some reason. So we had a lot of our residents, they couldn't use half the city sidewalk and businesses in nice weather would prop the door open and it's like, you, you couldn't use the sidewalk at all. It was terrible. Um, so uh, changes like that, they, it took like three to five years um, to finally get like, the, and we got some support from the county and the city, um, but just, like that the battle and the length of time it took to make change was frustrating. Um, but we but we made that change and now we've got the sidewalks widened, um, trees replanted and they are now we have residents that can actually like make more full use of their, their neighborhood. Um, and we also worked a lot with the businesses. Uh, so especially nonprofits, a lot of them, you know, wanted, you know, they weren't in compliance with ADA. They wanted to get there, but nonprofits were struggling for resources. So they didn't have the, the means to make those changes. Um, so we tried to find avenues for them to be able to get some resource to make those changes. We'd help write grants. Um, the city provided some facade grant funding uh, to help with door upgrades and things like that. But, you know, it's that's like just a drop in the bucket. So it was, it's been a battle finding resources. Um, which I think is what brings me to the conversation today um, is that with the uh, Save Our Stages rollout, which was really great, it was really good for venues to have kind of like that federal funding. Um, it's not, uh, there's, how do I phrase this? <laughs> um, it's not enough, like it's not enough. So I worked with um, some artists and I'm, I'm really obviously taking cues from my friends in the industry as well uh, that have been in this battle longer than I have. You know, we're, I was a, I was a kid when 88 passed and we're still not there. Um, and so I know people have been in this longer than I have, but uh, recognizing that like with my job and with my role, I have access to rooms where I can be a better advocate for these things and try to push resources towards the, like towards accessibility. Um, and for me, it's more than just like having audience seats that are accessible, but it's like, how do we create accessibility for the white room and the soundboard and <clears throat> my artist friends that can't work in certain venues because they can't access those resources. So um, we've been pushing for an extension of that Save Our Stages bill um, so we can get federal funding to invest in our nonprofits so that places like the Southern can update um, get in elevators, places they can update their soundboard, they can do things like that because it really is going to take a dedicated investment and it's been such an invisible thing that I think funders are just like, we got to save the businesses, but um, I think we need to focus on this too. So we've been pushing, we asked recently, um, we asked for an appropriation of $10 million to kickstart this um, and just be specifically for um, accessibility and venues and our um, art and cultural venues. Um, my friend Scott, he, he used this phrase that the arts, you know, they're they're getting nonprofit grant funding, they're getting these government grants, but you know, by extension, they're part of our public infrastructure, so they should be accessible to everybody to use them as a resource. So um, I've been just trying to fight for those things. And I honestly, like, um, I, I don't consider myself a champion. I'm just trying to, you know, navigate the rooms I'm in so I can be a better advocate. Thanks. Thank you so much. 
um, it does seem like it, it is a confluence of many elements, right? It's funding, it's awareness, it's finding advocates and allies, and it's, it is public infrastructure. So maybe it's partly about language, you know, making sure that we can um, connect all these pieces together in order to make some additional pro uh, progress. So you've all got wonderful, wonderful stories. And I, I heard quite a bit about um, the whole idea of, of stigmas um, and what you've had to face sometimes actually very physically and other times just even getting work and that kind of thing too. So um, how, let's, let's dig into that a little bit more and um, I'd love to hear from you about how we actually address the stigmas, um, maybe some things as a community and as individuals too. And um, yeah, I mean, you just, we can kind of flow into more of a discussion now, too. So if you have something to add, please speak up. Well, I have something, uh, several different uh, circumstances that uh, we dealt with uh, as far as that goes. Uh, I'll start out with uh, a young man. His name is Tommy. Uh, and I met him during the first year uh, of CDM. He was 17 and still in high school. He had, um, he still has autism. Um, they didn't really have that name then. They call it auditory dyslexia, and he could not converse. You could ask him a question, he couldn't. He would just say, "I'll buy that," or it doesn't matter what question it was. He always answered, "I'll buy that." And um, but he played guitar and he played a piano and he started writing songs actually at a pretty young age, much younger than he was at the time. And his mom con contacted us. Um, we dealt most with people with physical disabilities at the time. And I had no idea how to do any of this stuff. Like I said, I just wanted to play drums. And uh, so I started this so I can learn uh, at my own pace and maybe have them there that I can work with and do the same thing. But anyway, Tommy, he, um, he he wrote these songs. He wasn't a very good musician at the time. Uh, and like I said, he couldn't talk, but he could sing. He worked out of the other side of his brain. Apparently, he, there was a an, an brain injury at birth. And uh, so the right side of his brain was severely damaged, but the left side of his brain was still, I guess, functioning okay. Or sometimes it's enhanced. And he was writing songs and like, okay, well, let's see if we can put some songs together. Then he started playing the guitar and it was not really bad. And we had other musicians. So we kind of like turned him down and, uh, and had the other musicians carry it. And we started actually performing and doing stuff with that. But talking with people, which he never got a chance to do. Now in high school, he was picked on. He was not allowed to be in phys ed because he would get beat up and they would stick a kick me sign on his back and walk down the hallways and get beat up and kicked. Uh, and all these people were brutal to him. So uh, he was not allowed to be in phys ed, never allowed in the locker room. And, uh, uh, and he was in special ed all of his life. His IQ was very low, uh, but then he started working with us and we treated him with dignity and talked to him like a person and uh, his IQ started to rise. I mean, it went up quite a bit in one year's time where it didn't move at all. Uh, but when we played at his school, we went and did an, an assembly because we did a lot of them at a lot of schools to do handicap awareness programs <clears throat> at colleges and uh, all kinds of functions. Uh, he, would, all the kids that were picking on him were asking him for his autograph. So it was a huge transformation. And uh, and now I talk to Tommy all the time. We're like really close friends. I live in Virginia, he lives in New York. He calls me all the time and you could actually really carry on a conversation with Tommy. So his uh, his ability to speak got way better, but the, the stigma was so bad at the time that he was probably afraid to even say anything. And uh, other people in wheelchairs, um, I'm going to go to another one. Uh, we had several uh, people in wheelchairs. And uh, we had people come up and they're like, oh, great, great, great. And they'd start to talk to the person in the wheelchair asking a question, but they would ask the attendant that the person is with. Mm -hmm. uh, and, um, you know, we said, well, okay, you have a question, we'll ask the person in, in the wheelchair, like Patty 
or Linda or any, whoever it was that was there. You talk to them. They, they can speak. They can hear. And they can answer you. So it was a, a big thing that, uh, that it was, it's very, very insulting for somebody to ask somebody that's in a wheelchair but direct the question to a person that's with them just because they're standing. So that would be a huge thing to – it has overcome a lot, but it's, it's, it still has a lot of to, – to be fixed. So go ahead, yeah. somebody else. Stigma, there's a lot more, but I don't want to take up everybody's time. <laughs> well, and if we can look at – I mean, Donald, you're um, giving some examples that – of how we – one way to address it as a community, which is directly. Mm -hmm. invite, and to actually in, invite – folks to work with them and to kind of, I, I guess, sort of train people how to respond and that kind of thing as well. And well, they really need to just see it. You know, yeah. they need to see that there's a real person behind all of that. And uh, they have a brain and they have a heart and they're very talented. I mean, really talented. The songs that this guy, Tommy, writes would melt your heart. And, uh, and he can't really, I mean, he still has difficulty talking. But when he's singing, he's a totally different person. And you wouldn't think that he had any kind of disability at all. And his name is Tom 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 Ryan, R-Y-A-N. You can probably look him up on YouTube and stuff. I'm sure there's a whole bunch of songs out there. Actually, so. Tom is uh, watching. He's he is. Hey, Tom. <laughs> He he's a good buddy. Him. Yeah, he's a great kid. He's not a kid anymore. <laughs> you can say that. <laughs> he, he put a note in the in the comment section to say oh, how, any yeah. good <laughs> I can't yeah. see the things that I'm kind of oh, blind yeah. 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 and Stephen okay. I, I know I'm sorry you said about that but I, I have kind of gray hair and I'm wearing a blue shirt and a tie that has drums on it and stuff like that I don't know if you you needed why you said that with uh, for the visual part of it so right right and I'm wearing glasses oh, that's I, yeah. well, I appreciate that I mean it's, it's one <laughs> of those I, I think the uh, the importance of accessibility is just this right now. It's Zoom, you know, and as we get back to stages right now, Zoom is our stage. And one of the things that even as I am a visually impaired person, I born with retinitis pigmentosa and later diagnosed with macular degeneration. I, for example, I've never been able to drive. Uh, it would never. I've always wanted to go to a Vikings game, uh, but I I can see the field is green. That's about it. And even as uh, we, we talk about stigmas and how the importance of self-description and things like this, mm -hmm. you know, uh, because I mean, there's tens of millions of blind and low vision people in the United States. And you, uh, you, you spoke about exposure. And so it, it's important, you know, that if you're gonna have uh, things like this, that self-description are good. So you are including more people and it's tough and even, even I forgot to do it at the beginning, and I'm the person that we're supposed to do it for. So I, I think <laughs> you can do it for we, have to, we have to give each other some grace. Mm -hmm. And I think to allow people to make mistakes, which right now in this society, no one's allowed to make a mistake. And I think at least how I see it as somebody in the disability community, to allow people like you said, you know, speak to the person, you know, it's about, it's exposure therapy, but it's like, mm -hmm. we're not scary animals. We're great people with clever talents and we want to work and have friendships too. Just talk to us, be exposed to us. And so exactly. I think it's some of it's organic. Um, the more people see us about, um, I, I think, you know, some of that stigma will go away, but, but we also not only must be advocates uh, for, uh, well, we, I'll, I'll just put it this way. We simply have to be advocates for ourselves because society will not change unless we step forward. And that's why I chose early in my film career, which isn't that long. I mean, I've only been doing film for 10 years, but early on in my career, I chose to be very open about me being a uh, sight challenge, visually impaired, low vision. And I mean, there's even terminology for that, that even I need to catch up on. Well, which term do I use? Well, I'm not gonna, you know, be mean to myself if I misuse the, you know, a, a term. Um, Political correctness. But, but, you know, I chose to be. Sorry. The what? I said, uh, 
Sorry, okay. I said political uh, correctness. <laughs> yeah. Did I mess everything yeah, up? I think it does get in the way. And, and all I'm saying is for, okay, there, there must be like a five second delay on here. Um, but what I'm asking for, for, for people who are, who are watching and who are listening you know, is, is to please don't be afraid. <laughs> just, just ask questions. It's cool. Don't assume we should answer them. Um, but it's okay to have questions because we want to be more open about it. And even, for example, I, I have two friends. Uh, here's a good example. Um, I have a buddy who's uh, an editor on a, on a bunch of TV shows, like uh, The Good Doctor is one of them, um, a, a few other TV shows. And he is you know, nearing, I think, about 60 years old. And he, for the first time, finally felt comfortable coming out as somebody with ASD. He's on the, the, the autism, autism spectrum. But mm -hmm. he was afraid to because he hadn't noticed other people being open about it. And I think if we are willing to take a risk, to take a chance, it's like going on dates, right? Well, when's the appropriate time we bring up, hey, I'm visually impaired or hey, I have this, you know, just so you know. Or if you go into job interviews, it is an individual decision about when you bring it up, if you bring it up at all. And, and one, one, one last thing that, uh, that, that, that I want to say is for non-disabled people out there, when you interact with somebody with a disability, whether it's for a job or whatever, please assume we've already figured out what we, we as disabled people have already figured out. I've had numerous directors and producers and editors of people say, all right, well, you're coming out of this project. Well, what can we do for you? And I have to giggle. I'm like, hey, I'm blind. I already have all the accessibility tools I need. It's, I'm supposed to be serving you. And so there's this assumption by non-disabled people that, would, that when they run into somebody with a disability, well, non-disabled people have to solve their problems for them. And in my work, that is absolutely not the case. I have found the tools. And so give us some grace as we shall extend grace to you so we can all learn together and move forward. I, I, I really love that uh, sentiment, Stephen. I, I think I, I resonate with that a lot. Um, I think sometimes I feel like these conversations uh in in my experience sometimes they get a little too like coddly like you know what what can we do for you how can we do something to make this easier for you but i something i think a, a lot of at least in my experience with with friends with spinal cord injuries like uh, we, we don't realize like how much power we actually have, like as just people, like, and that we, we need to use that and, and put ourselves out there. And, you know, like in, in my experience, I, I kind of spent my first few years as a musician, just forcing my way through the door. I wasn't waiting for a ramp to happen. I wasn't, you know, I was playing house shows in basements. Like I, 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 I and not everybody's willing to do that, but um, like to a certain extent, that's what we have to do um, because we can't, we can't wait for things to happen. Um, so I, I really resonate with that. And also I am a, a white male, uh, brown beard, shaggy, bedhead, red shirt, and I'm sitting in my room in South Minneapolis. Great, thank you. I think I'm the only one who hasn't done that part. So <laughs> an older white lady with short hair and glasses, uh, wearing a jean jacket and sitting in my uh, sort of beige-ish room as well. So I um, appreciate all this. This is great. Um, so so these are these are some of the ways to fight back against the stigmas um, from from largely from a personal standpoint too. Um, what are some other things that we might look at as a community, um, as a performing arts community, as an arts community in, in general, uh, to work on those stigmas? I work against those stigmas. 
Or do you feel like you've said your piece there? <laughs> Just understanding. I mean, when we worked together, the fact that we knew that, say, Tommy uh, had a really difficult time gathering and grasping what we were trying to do, and we were also having a difficult time understanding what he was trying to do, the patience to deal with both of those aspects were huge. We had a keyboard player who was almost completely deaf, and he uh, can only, like, feel the bass part of it. Phenomenal keyboard player. But we had to work around him instead of him working around us because he couldn't really hear a lot of things. Like he could hear the bass drum, but he couldn't hear the snare drum and cymbals and stuff like that. So he, he would set the pace and then we would follow that. So that was a, a completely opposite way of doing things. Um, getting on the stages, you talked about that, Gabriel, and going into basements and, and stuff like that. You did it because you wanted to do it. We did it because we wanted to do it. I mean, it, it took an, an incredible amount of inspiration for, from each one of us to go out there and say, all right, here I am. I'm going to do this no matter what it takes. And, uh, and we did it. And so many things have changed because of it. Not that that's what we needed to do is change everything, but we wanted to be on stage playing. Right. It was all about the music. I mean, our slogan was pursue your musical dreams. And that's what we did and have been doing all this time. So, uh, but there was a whole lot of different aspects and circumstances and patience is just key and understanding. Right. And along with patience, then persistence. Yes. Not, not pulling back. I really love what you just said about it's about the music. So mm -hmm. it seems like it's the art that drives each of you. Um, and then you figure it out from there. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, I mean, we're musicians. We're taking chances. I mean, I consider myself yeah. having a being a musician first before I consider myself having a disability. And so, as musicians, we're taking chances anyway. We're we're playing, you know, you know, crummy bars or, or places because we we want to, you know, play them. We're willing to take risks already. And so, right. going there, getting it done, letting people see us, letting people hear us, and get like, oh, I've never met somebody a, a wheelchair user before who's highly competent. Oh my God, you know. Oh, yeah. hey, they're actually a human being. Oh yeah, getting it, getting a, uh, you know, something up here. Hey, getting a ramp up to the stage. Not only is that great for him, but hey, that makes loadouts so much easier for yes. the thousands of musicians <laughs> yeah. that are gonna be coming through my building. Like sometimes, yeah. like let's turn it around on them. Say here, this is how this benefits you. This doesn't just benefit me. So you have to yeah. rise above the. The, the general think of people because they because uh, I hate to admit it, but we don't live in a world that was made for us. And so we are constantly, you know, trying to figure out, you know, what to do and how to help people help us. And we have to rise above some of the ignorance and some of the ignorance isn't negative. It's not meant, it's not meant to be harsh or evil, but people just don't know. And it's almost like we are reluctant ambassadors for progress. Yeah. So but, that's a know, good but, but I'll, I'll stop. I keep, I keep jumping in. No, no, that's, that's, lots of handicap awareness programs. We would actually literally go to schools and do uh, a, a little concert and then questions and answers. So people, because they never seen even people in wheelchairs. I mean, you know, all these elementary school kids and junior high and, and that actually we did high school and colleges and everything, but people didn't know. People just figured that people that were in wheelchairs stayed at home and did nothing all their lives. So just back to where you are there, it was uh, just the whole awareness to the, uh, the entire community. Right, right. Yeah, I know I, when I was growing up, you didn't ever see disabled people because the That's world right. wasn't made for them to be able to function, right? So mm -hmm. um, generations grew up not meeting people with disabilities, um, mm -hmm. not because they didn't want to, but because there just wasn't any opportunity. There was no accessibility. That's there right. were freak right. show laws in the early 20th century saying people with disabilities should be kept inside. They're literal U.S. laws wow. to keep disabled people out of the public eye. Wow. Yes. I think they're called the, the freak laws or something. I mean, that was like the 19 <laughs> uh, or 1910s, something like that. <laughs> so we've made a fair yeah, amount of progress. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Jamie, anything from your perspective you'd like to, to note on this conversation? 
Um, yeah, I've just been trying to be mindful about taking up too much space too, but I think something that I would say is like, I serve on a lot of boards um, with nonprofits and I work with a lot of nonprofits and <clears throat> it's the same things happening with our diversity conversations too, where I think as a sector, we've gotten kind of good at speaking the language um, about inclusivity, but not always practicing it in the best ways. and. So I encourage folks that serve on boards or if you're in a position where you're choosing venues or you're talking with other people, it's like if, you know, if you're able-bodied, you keep that stuff in mind too. Like it shouldn't just take, it shouldn't just take, like it shouldn't be so invisible. You should be able to bring that up as well and like use your positions of privilege where you can choose better spaces and make those your priority as a board member um, fight for that funding um, because nonprofits want to make those changes and it does cost money to retrofit spaces and artists deserve to make a living from their income but it's going to be hard to run a light board if you can't access it so um, I just encourage people um, especially those that have able-bodied privilege to to um, to make those make those spaces a little bit more aware of it so that it doesn't get forgotten I mean we don't have VSA Minnesota anymore we're losing some of that funding so trying to fight for that because I know like the regional arts councils want to be able to do that as well. We are funding production, but we're not funding capacity for organizations and that needs to shift. So my hope is like, we keep using this phrase like build back better. And it's like, okay, yeah, but if we're going to do that, let's like actually do that and really build back better in this way. Yeah, that's, think, that's can fantastic. I, Go ahead. Can I jump in really quick? Uh, yep. To kind of piggyback a little bit on that, I'm, you know, I think what we're what we're all kind of talking about right now is is representation, and uh, we're I think we're talking a, a lot about it on kind of the ground level, the grassroots level, but I, I think it also needs to be talked about in the in the in the kind of higher ups in the in the rooms of power on, on the boards on the commissions you know where is where is the representation in in the rooms that hold the money the power the you know the funding you know um, cuz we can we can talk all day about um, you know getting stages and and um, you know seeing seeing people in the world with disabilities but there i think there's a a big um a big piece that we need <laughs> we need people from our community in the, in the places where you make decisions that affect us you know um so i i, I think i'll i'll just end there and throw that in there really, I, 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 I want to <clears throat> go ahead I totally I just agree. Say there's actually some. Hi. Get paused. Okay, Stephen. <laughs> I think this actually so maybe it's the universe telling me I, I shouldn't uh, actually make this comment, but but to, to, the, to that that comment right there, I, I do know uh, there there is some movement uh, with a a. a, a a governing body uh, in in the music industry about the importance of this is beginning to being spoken about because I've reached out to some of these musicians you know as a running a nonprofit uh, you know one of the only nonprofits uh, out there that's only de dedicated to people with disabilities we don't you know dip our toes in a bunch of the things um, but I've reached out to some of these music oriented places and I've gotten the hand I've just straight up gotten the hand right. Whereas in the film industry, we're talking to people at Disney and Netflix um, and, you know, and people at the Oscars to make change because you are right. We need people in power. Where are musicians with disabilities selling 100 million copies, right? You know, Demi Lovato came out with stuff. You know, she's been, you know, uh, more outspoken about it. But where are the other people? You know, the only the only people that non-disabled people know of people with disabilities are Stevie Wonder and Ray Charles, right? Um, you know, where, where are the others? And there are plenty of others, but you know, they, they just haven't been lifted up yet. And so I, I'm simply echoing your comment that we do need people in positions of power to make moves. It's very challenging, but I do want to say I have been speaking with people that have been moving that ball forward in the music community. Um, 
but it's slow. It's so slow. Yeah, it's frustrating for sure. Yeah, well, that's a very central tenet of Minnesota Music Coalition now is uh, mm -hmm. our board has been working very diligently on a new strategic plan. And a big centerpiece of that is um, really a serious look at diversity of all kinds. Um, and what does that mean and how can we function as a service organization to support those communities as well. So um, look for more stuff from MMC because we'll be, we'll be doing it. I mean, that's part of this, having this panel um, is part of that plan too. It's, it's visibility, but it's also then looking for next steps, which is really, really important as mm -hmm. well. This is yeah, very good. This is very good. Um, so you, some of you have talked about improvements that you've been seeing taking place mm -hmm. in the music industry or the film industry in this case too. Uh, what excites you about those, those improvements? Um, and I suppose we might, we might talk a little bit about what frustrates you too. We've heard a bit of that already. So some of the improvements. Well, I've seen a million improvements because there was no uh, ramps at any stages when we started out, and now most stages have ramps. That was one big thing. Um, equipment is easier to use. This whole uh, internet, uh, the, what we're using right now, the forum we're using right now is massive, and COVID had a lot to do with the way this came out uh, and is being used. Um, but yeah, I've seen, oh, so many different things. You know what else was part of uh, this too? And, and I uh, made a complaint years ago. There was a, a theater called Jones Beach Theater on Long Island. Uh, and I went to see Billy Joel. I studied with Billy Joel's drama, Lib DeVito, when I finally started taking drum lessons uh, in New York. And uh, we went to see then the show after they did their storm for an album. And uh, friends of mine were in wheelchairs and uh, my, myself, I went that and I got handicapped seats. They were the absolute worst seats in the whole place. I wrote a letter to the people that run Jones Beach Theater. They contacted me back. They said they're going to redo the stadium. Now the seats for handicapped seating are the best seats in the whole house. I mean, they redid the whole place and put them right perfect in the middle and easy to get to and you can see everything. So, uh, you know, you just, first of all, you got to just speak up. That's a big thing. And if you have the power, and I did at the time, uh, to speak up, and it made a big, big difference. So um, making equipment for uh, some of my bass player had muscular dystrophy, has muscular dystrophy. And he can't play now because he's progressed so much. But I made a stand for him uh, so he can just sit on, in a thing behind him and play without bearing the weight of, of his instrument, which is a big thing. Um, uh, Glenn, like I said, with the techniques and stuff, I had to make a different ad adaptive equipment. I made a special drum pad for myself, which I'll talk about later, uh, so that you don't have to have the neck and back strain. That uh, Gabriel would probably really appreciate being able to use stuff. It would be able to put it right into an area where you not specifically the drum pad, but the interchangeable tabletop and stuff like that. Uh, that I designed and got a patent on and uh, making it and marketing it. And uh, it's a big thing. Um, uh, other things, uh, geez, I, I don't know there's so many and I just, I'm, I'm all messed up with my notes here because I'm nervous. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. I'd feel much better if I was back there playing well, you're doing on my great. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. Well, I also yeah, you would want to you know, just say something quick about you know some some improvement like the Oscars we we partnered with, with them and also other people in the uh, blind low vision committee uh, to bring audio description to the Oscars for the first time this year so this is the, the first year there was a ramp and there was uh, you know audio description um, I'm uncertain what they did for ASL uh, because it wasn't on the main broadcast, uh, but that's still a challenge. But I just simply wanted to speak to, yes, there is progress uh, that is going yeah. on. Especially since I started, it's a huge amount because there were no ramps, no handicap seating and there were all that other stuff that 
uh, even just opening up a door when you go into a store. I mean, when they asked us when we were part of the ADA and we were doing gigs and doing handicap awareness stuff, what do you need? And they were asking what should be in this bill. And we all, we had input Mm -hmm. and a lot of this stuff eventually, and and it took years and years. And Jamie's talking about how much time and you guys are all talking about how much time this is 1986. You know, you guys probably weren't even born yet, (laughs) but yeah, it's just like kind of crazy. We've been at it for a long time. And uh, they were actually in 1986, just started talking about, uh, the 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 ADA. So it took actually four years before it actually became a law. And uh, you know, it started out in Reagan years, and then it wound up in uh, George Senior years that they they put it to law. And we celebrated like crazy. We were doing gigs, and we were playing, doing all this stuff. It was really great. So has the ADA um, progressed at all? Is- did it do its thing, and then has it continued to improve since then? Now that I don't know, but I guess they've been implementing all of the the parts of the laws because all these things happen, like curb cuts. Right. Uh, that, that was massive. I mean, if you look at some of the old movies and somebody in a wheelchair and they get up to a curb, they can manage to get down the curb and then they get to the other side of the street there and there's traffic going by and puddles and all kinds of stuff, and they just can't get back up on the other side until somebody comes along and helps them up. Uh, not have curb cuts, right. you know, and, and, and there's a lot of different ways and they have them so that you go slow down the curb cuts, you know, they have little bumps and things. So right. all of this stuff becomes, you push a button on a door and a door opens up for you. Mm-hmm. Try to open up some of them heavy doors. They couldn't do it. People could not go anywhere. It's the independence for people in wheelchairs has uh, progressed a, a real lot because of, of that kind of stuff, those laws. And when they put new doors in there, they have to have it so that it has a power opening uh, and uh, from the inside and the outside. So you can go by yourself. So uh, Gabriel, who's in a wheelchair, can go any place, which you couldn't do that back in the 80s. You couldn't go anywhere without somebody helping you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Stephen, yeah. I think I read one time the, the actual employment rate of of blind or, or vision impaired people is, is very, very low. Is that still the case? Yes. And it is actually similar to uh, uh, folks with ASD uh, on the autism spectrum. It's about 70%, 70 percent, seven zero, are either underemployed or unemployed. And so, hey, uh, blind, low vision and autism people unite. <laughs> we yes. we, uh, we have so much to do. Yep. Our stats um, match. So yeah, it, it, it yeah, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> I think the the biggest improvement in my mind is is kind of again piggybacking off of Donald the the kind of embracing of technology. Um, cause I think that is, I mean, that's why I'm still writing music, like because of music software, I'm still able to do that. Um, I, I'm, I'm a little bit of a Luddite, but <laughs> I, there's a lot of stuff out there that I'm not taking advantage of as a musician. Um, and, and, and it's cool to hear about Steven's, uh, nonprofit who's, you know, funding a lot of um, like equipment to people, because um, uh, uh, again, in my mind, that's that's uh, that's like um, art that's arming or uh, arming people with um, uh, tools to you know pursue their dreams in the arts, um, and and so. Uh, for me, it's like let's let's keep that train going. Like, let's keep up with the technology because that, you know, the invention of the door button probably brought on some of those laws. You know, like, um, so yeah, that's. I'll leave it there. Stephen, could you tell us a little bit more about how your um, foundation works in that regard? Oh, sure. 
Well, I will certainly take advantage of this opportunity because one of the challenges is the noise that's out there. So how do you get your message out? We are a Able Artist Foundation, ableartist.org. Uh, it's small. We're tiny. <laughs> we run it out of my condo, for Pete's sake. Uh, <laughs> and yet we have members in 27 countries. Mm -hmm. And we have partnerships with dozens of companies. And so what one of the uh, benefits is if you're on disability, if you receive SSI or SSDI, you can become a member of Able Artist Foundation and get anything from our partners for at least half off all their stuff, all of it, not just the stuff they're trying to get rid of, but it's software. It's not the hardware. Uh, because those are me mechanical costs that, you know, the, 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 the margin for musical instruments is so small anyway. And so our partnerships are with people who create software. We haven't been able to get Logic. We haven't been able to get Pro Tools. We haven't been able to get Steinberg Cubase yet. But all of these sample libraries, you know, sample packs and all that from all the major, major players, they are partners with us. Uh, but just so you know, too, we got a contest right now. So anybody with a disability, you don't have to be on disability. If you have a disability, we, we've got a contest. And if you win, you get like $5,000 worth of stuff. And we also partner you with music companies, with licensors to get your music, you know, onboarded into these companies. So go to our site and check it out. And finally, we're doing an instrument grant. Uh, we're launching it in the next month for, for people who need money for a guitar, physical instruments. You know, we're providing an instrument grant for people here in the United States, and we're le and we're looking to help so and support people of Minnesota because it's been hard to come full circle. It's been hard to identify people in Minnesota because there are no lists of people with disabilities. I've reached out to different groups. Hey, who are the people with disabilities you serve? We would like to share. Here's what we do. Here's here's something that may benefit them. We can't talk about our members. Even we can't talk about our members. So how can we identify people? And so I, please forgive the point of personal privilege of talking about this nonprofit, um, but it's important because this is one of the few times I've been able to speak to people in Minnesota. I wanna help Minnesotans. I wanna support Minnesota musicians because I live here. I love this community. Uh, so I hope that, you know, musicians with disabilities out there, you know, check out ableartist.org. You know, we, we want to support you in, in the ways that, that we have the capacity to do so. So thank you for, for giving me a very open door uh, with that digital button for me to push to, to speak about that today. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, that's that's why we're here, Stephen, is to is to really open up these doors and to give everyone a chance to talk about your projects, but also the to have the rest of the community be able to see, oh, that I might be able to tap into this, or I'm really interested in that. Um, that's that's a really big piece, as we've all said. We started off talking about awareness, right? And um, and that's that's yeah. what we're trying to do. Yeah. So that's that's terrific. Uh, Ableartist.org. Is that right? Yep. I yep. will. Well, singular. Able artist. No S on the end. Ableartist.org. Able artist. Okay. Let me throw that in the comments while you're continuing here, too, um, because I know there's some other organizations in town. Are, are you guys familiar with SLAM Academy? Um, they do a lot of technology training, um, and they have really generous um, scholarship programs. So um, I have no idea what their determination is and all, but they're and I think MMC certainly could step up as well. So um, thinking about partnerships, nothing nothing solid at this point, but thinking about possible partnerships um, would be a, a great thing to come out of a conversation like this. So nice, nice stuff. Um, let's see. So maybe that, that kind of leads into the next question, which is um, really the summit as a whole, and certainly this conversation might spark some ideas or interest in a, a variety of ways. Um, what are some of the sparks you'd like to put out there to um, listening? Um, and to that point, how can our community show support or get involved in some other ways? Stephen, you sort of launched that conversation, so anybody else feel free to, uh, to chime in there. Well, I guess any kind of uh, equipment that could be designed to help people 
Um, I made, like I said, I made this uh, portable table and drum pad. If you don't mind, I could show it to you. Sure. Uh, I made it originally as a drum practice pad. I started taking lessons. And I know it's hard to see. Oh, this one was uh, autographed by uh, Liv DeVito. But it's, uh, it's really adjustable. And you slide the base of it under your thighs. Sit in any kind of chair. I don't know. Can you see it? I'm trying to see if I can make it visible. Yeah. It folds, and uh, they're made out of wood. And this one has a nice gum rubber on it. Um, and they're really durable. They last for years and years. Uh, they're and it's good for dramas. Okay, so it was designed to relieve neck and back strain. A lot of people have neck and back strain. Then the top becomes interchangeable and. Then it becomes a reading table or for laptops or whatever. And it, it, it does the same exact thing. It'll fold up to this small, four inches, and it opens up to much, much bigger. I'm trying to get it in the picture. And you slide the base under your thighs, or you can use it on a tabletop. And it was also really good for people with vision impairment. So you can get up there really close to your face and not have to hold a book like right here. But this table will hold it for you, too, if you're reading on a tabletop. Or if you're sitting in a recliner or whatever, so uh, there was all there was several different types of um, adaptive pieces of equipment that would be really helpful for people. That would be one push that I would like to see mm -hmm. for the community and for just uh, uh, other places or, or abilities to be able to do music. Because that was my design was to be able to play music with other people and uh, different forums and uh, this internet is really a good forum for that right now because we can reach out to people in other communities where we used to have to do it at my studio on Long Island if people could get there. Right. And then they would promote it from there. We're going out and doing gigs in different places with our band Range of Motion. That was the name of the band guys, Range of Motion. How cool is that? Huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Pidgey, thank you, Pidgey, if you're watching. She did that. So uh, there was a lot of good things. Uh, so, but anyway, go ahead. It's next, I'm trying. I'm lost. I'm all lost for words. <laughs> That's okay. Okay. Other ideas. This is a great, great opportunity. To just throw them out. With, you know, no guarantees of what's going to happen. But if we don't get mm -hmm. the ideas out in the world, they can't uh, sprout. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what are your what are your what are your dreams at this point well i th this isn't necessarily an idea but it, the Stephen, what you said earlier reluctant ambassadors has really stuck with me um and i it makes me think like the disability community shouldn't expect um, other, you know, people, organizations to do the work for them. And also those organizations, those people shouldn't expect us to do the work as well. I, I don't know if that, maybe that's not the right way to say that, but like that, I don't. I don't really want to, um, like, advocate for stages, but I have to. Mm -hmm. Like, be, uh, otherwise, I'm not gonna. You know, it's. I'm gonna be lifted up onto stages for the rest of my life, and I don't really want that. So I've I've had multiple conversations about this with. Um, some of my other disabled artist friends and it's like it's it almost feels like it's our duty to be advocates even though I don't really want to be an advocate right. I want to be a musician you know right. um, and so th like in my mind it's like an expectation thing like I I can't expect others to do the work for me and those others shouldn't expect the work to happen from me as well but we do it anyways because it's it's what needs to be done um to to make the world a 
a friendly place for disabled people because it wasn't built that way, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so it's a, it's a little more of an abstract dream than a, an actual thing. But yeah, that's, that's my spark. That, that's a really important, really important thing to say, Gabriel. Yeah, that's, you didn't get in, into this life to, uh, to be an advocate, but to be a musician. So how can, right. we, how can the rest of the world assist that process, I guess? Make it they less don't get it. Mm -hmm. right. right. They just don't get it. And our thing was, uh, my thing was, and it wound up being, is the, the therapy of, of being a musician. I mean, I don't know if you go someplace else when you're playing. Uh, it's like, I'm not me anymore. When I'm playing and I'm into it and I'm going and I, I don't feel this pain, this chronic pain that I feel all the time. And it's, I'm just somewhere else until it stops. And then all of a sudden I'm back to me again. But it, it, I'm better. It really, really is. is uh, I can't really say like a drug, but kind of is like a drug. Um, uh, it's it's a mental and a physical therapy, and for more and more people to uh, enjoy that and experience it, there's always been what I have been about. Not just ramps, like you said, but that's a big thing. You can't do it unless you have ramps. Most people don't have the accessibility. I mean, the access to people that we created when we did that because we had volunteers. All of our equipment was moved in. We were put on the stages. All that stuff was removed, put back in the trucks, put back in my studio. Everything was done for us, but it's not like that for me now. If I go out and play with people, I have to do it myself. And I don't want to whine and carry on. Oh, I have a bad back and I lost jobs because of that. People still just don't get it, you know, and, and mine is invisible. I'm not in a wheelchair. I can walk. I mean, I walked with a cane for many, many years. But I try not to do it because it winds up hurting me in other places. But it's invisible. They don't feel this overwhelming pain all over my body. So, uh, you know, we got to get past that stuff and just get out there and play music because it helps on the inside. That's the core. Um, I'd like to say to anybody who's watching, uh, if you have questions for the panelists, please throw them in the chat area and we'll, we'll try to get through them. Um, Tom, Tom Ryan says, ask, is asking if, um, Stephen and Gabriel are on Facebook or would be willing to make contact. Um, Tom oh, is, yeah. is Don's, oh, friend, yeah. Don's friend. Yes. I'm, I'm absolutely down to make contact. That'd okay. Donald, um, I, do, I do a little bit of touring yeah, here and there. And one of my dreams is to come out to the east coast so cool. let's jam maybe we'll, maybe we'll link up and jam sometime yeah, yeah. Be great. sweet that sounds wonderful I, um, I got a chance to learn a lot of different types of music through the years where i didn't know how to play the drums at all when i started this organization i had to actually start from scratch and start taking lessons even after i had a whole bunch of musicians already there i still didn't know how to play the drums and so i started taking lessons and it was uh, you know it enabled me to do that. So it was great. But yes, I can do all kinds of things and I would love to. All of you, if you're musicians, I, I and even if we don't do it this way, we can do it through the internet. And I'd like to take advantage more of recording uh, and getting the proper equipment. I don't have any of that stuff, you know, with microphones and things like that to be able to record remotely with other people even tommy i've been trying to get together because we started doing recordings many years ago and everything kind of came to a screeching halt and i moved and and none of it happened but uh well not none of it did we have a, a one cd out with a bunch of his songs and he does a lot of his songs himself now but um to be able to do that and finish a lot of unfinished business would be great and Tom, uh, if you would like to, I honestly don't use a ton of Facebook. I just, I'm very reclusive. I honestly, personally, I can't stand social media. Um, so, uh, but if you would, uh, shoot me an email. Uh, it's info at ableartist.org. And my team, they'll, they'll send it to me and I, and, I, and I see those emails. So reach out.
uh, you know, we can chat back and forth. So just info, and this is for anybody, info at ableartist.org. I'd, I'd love to chat with them. Great. Also, if anybody wants to get in touch with me, you can send me uh, an email uh, uh, to sales, the word sales, at K-A-Y-J-A-E dot com. That's the name of my company that makes these uh, the drum pads and tables. And uh, our website is uh, K-A-Y-J-A-E dot com, K-J dot com. So right. as soon as okay. I was it out there, that'd be cool. Gabriel, what's a way to get a hold of you? Um, I'm on, I'm on all the social medias. Um, my username is at freakdom, F R E A Q U E D O M. Um, and then you can also email me. My, my email is pepperjackprince at gmail.com. Um, hit me up. And, uh, how about you, Jamie? I'm also on the socials. Um, I most of my tags are pure nomina, which is P U R E N O U M E N A. I'm also that moniker at gmail.com. Um, and my website is Jamie Schumacher, Jamie Schumacher.com. That's S C H U M A C H E R. Thank you for being generous with that. Several people are asking. Um, Brian Johnson asks, how do I become a member of Able Artist Foundation? Oh, uh, just at ableartist.org. I mean, if, you, if you're on uh, some of our programs like our contests and our grants do not require you to be on disability. And so the only program that requires uh, paperwork, SSI, SSDI paperwork, is the, the discount program. So if you got your award letter and you got an email address, you're good to okay. go. Very uh, user-friendly pr process. Excellent, excellent. So we can check out- Ableartist.org. So right, right. That sounds good. Anything else anyone would like to uh, say to wrap up this afternoon? Just pursue I'm your okay. musical dreams. Sorry, go ahead. What was that, uh, Donald? I was gonna say, I'm, pursue I'm your hoping. musical dreams. Okay, okay. all right. Too late. <laughs> Sorry, Stephen. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Dude. We're good. We're good. I've spoken <laughs> enough. So please, uh, you know, Jamie, you know, hop in here. Oh, I was going to also just, I didn't, um, before I think I got clopped up, I was going to thank Gabriel for what you had to say before about, you know, making sure that there's seats at the table for everybody. It's not just about advocating for us, that representation, that's been huge. Um, and I was thanking you for that, but then everything got clogged up. So then I think I talked over Stephen, Stephen while trying to thank you. So sorry if I interrupted you unintentionally, Stephen and Gabriel, I had wanted to say thank you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so much good good material here today, and I really appreciate all of your your input and um, and the fantastic work that you're each doing in your own um, arenas. It's really wonderful. Um, and thank you for having us. Much, absolutely, and this is great fodder for us uh, on the board again at um, at MMC to see what ways we can continue to to support the community. So. Much appreciated. So with that, I think we will sign off. And uh, once again, so appreciate your your time today and uh, all the all the good conversation. It was wonderful. Okay. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank it was you. Great. Yeah, Thank everybody. You. Great meeting all of you. Bye bye. Bye. Okay. Thank you, Jane. Uh, Jane. Yeah, Janice. I'm sorry. I can't yeah, see. Sorry. <laughs> I yeah. All right. Bye. Okay. Good night. Bye. 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 <laughs> it's weird.